Um, so what I'm really saying here is that the latency between something happening and your eyeball seeing, seeing it needs to be less than your human attention span, which is you know, something like 10 seconds. Now if you can have an outage that lasts less than 10 seconds or less than 30 seconds, say, then it probably nobody will notice because their browsers will just retry and it will carry on. You, know, you, you can get away with it. You can get, with, get away with an awful lot of 10 second outages because there's enough retry in the system to work through it. So just to wrap it up, the two <coughs> core concepts here, one is separation of concerns, making sure that the, micro, the microservices are separating concerns in the right way so that you can get these bounded contexts and you can operate independently. Um, so some forward thinking, this is the stuff I think is currently interesting. I spent the last couple of weeks learning Go, I actually wrote some code and I just posted it on GitHub and there's like, I don't know what I wrote, a thousand lines of code or something. Uh, actually having fun, in fact, having too much fun and not getting enough sleep because I'm going home at night and writing code and go. So, um, anyway, it's summer and the VC world slows down a bit, and this is what I did. For the, this is what I did this summer. Um, almost all of the interesting new code I'm seeing is in Go. This is, it's really remarkable. I mean, I, I'm talking about enterprise IT software. Docker's written in Go. Uh, that's a fairly well-known example, but lots and lots of things like Vivid Cortex. That SaaS application is written in Go. Uh, Cloud Foundry and AppSera written in Go. Uh, Flynn, which is a, a Docker thing that's written in Go. So there's an awful lot of tooling and I just keep finding more and more. So there's something happening here that's turning into a productive new language for getting things done. Um, and so tooling around Go becomes an interesting problem to solve. And the thing that the code I wrote is like microservices within Go. Uh, on my laptop I, I had 100,000 microservices running, you know, Go routines running in a single, single process. Um, I could create 100,000 and shut them down in two seconds and send 600,000 messages between them. That's what my little thing does. Anyway, if that sounds interesting, talk to me later or go find my GitHub account. Um, the Lean Enterprise book has been coming out all year and it has, it's been continuously developed and it's not quite there yet and they haven't quite put it so you can get paper versions. You can get the current version of the digital copy of it right now. This is really almost encapsulates everything I'm working on. It's lean, it's continuous delivery and DevOps, and it's written by Jess Humble, who wrote the uh, continuous delivery book that most people are working on. But that book is now a few years old. And then the other thing is this whole move from monolithic to microservices. I, I found a nice I a little diagram for that. So these are the things that I'm mostly worrying about as interesting sort of leading edge technologies that are in some way or another disrupting parts of the industry, and then that causes you know, other things to happen. So, so this is the last slide. Uh, I can be found in various places uh, doing talks and there are videos and things around the food. Okay, take a few questions, yeah? So, you have mentioned uh, uh, innovation breakthrough uh, in product life cycle, which is in the back end, which is continuous uh, integration or continuous delivery. How about the front end? Uh, innovation in terms of product so, uh, so the question is about innovation in product management and continuous delivery there. I'd say that, you know, I'd say the biggest difference looking at the kind of product managers that, that Netflix has for dealing with this environment, they are, have to be statistically literate. Right? You know, they are customer advocates, they aren't technologists, but they have to understand about you know, confidence intervals and A-B testing and, and you know, a little bit of statistics, not you know, enough to get their day job done. But you have to be, you have to be able to understand how to come up with a good hypothesis and test it. And that is the job of the product manager in, in this world. And you come up with lots of hypotheses. And if you're good, you come up with good estimate, good guesses for what to test. And that go, turns into the company learns from that. So that's kind of the, the, the new style for doing product management. You want to do very fine-grained, small projects that incrementally let you test your way forward. Um, there's also, you know, sometimes you have to go test bigger ideas than start up new things, but that's that's less frequent. Because at front end, like in, in, uh, in the product uh, life cycle, product management, it looks like it's still an app which has to set up science. As a uh, uh, yeah. Um, so the question, the, the point is that Product management is an art, not a science. Yeah, you, you still have to have a good idea that's worth testing and is testable, right? And then the engineering job is to work with the product manager to say, okay, here is your five ideas. These three are testable easily. This, these two are impossible. This one won't work, whatever. You know, 
And you can argue about whether they're good ideas. And you know, the product manager and engineering manager have to work together on prioritizing things to do. But the key thing is to make the things as small and isolated as possible. And then you can turn around a lot of them very quickly. If you build up, the bigger and longer a project takes, the more resources it uses. And the more, um, it, it's, it's the, it, it doesn't just take the, the, it, the resources increase sort of exponentially because they end up touching more and more things. You get all the coordination overhead and all the cross integration overhead that you avoid if you're doing things incrementally. Because you try a bunch of things and you throw away half of them because they didn't work. Uh, if you don't find out that half your stuff didn't work until you integrated it 15 times, you're, you've done a lot of waste in the system. Any questions? Okay. When you started working with microservices at Netflix, what you were to solve a scalability issue, and you, you discovered the agility benefits of it, or was the other way around? The, the question is, when we started doing this at Netflix, were we trying to solve scalability or agility? We, were, we had a goal at the time to make the developers productive. And we also had a team that at that point had reached around 100 engineers, and the developers were stomping on each other's code all the time. So we would have the movie object and the customer object, and everyone would change it in every release in incompatible ways. And so the QA engineering integration would be to try and take you know, 15 different, maybe not 50, but a bunch of different incompatible changes to these core objects and try and mash them all together. So, and then when you try to roll it out, uh, you'd have the new monolithic build, talking mostly about the DVD service, kind of circa 2008. Um, you'd try and roll it out and it would just be broken. And so, now which bit broke? I don't know. Uh, it's the interaction of these you know, 50 different jar files. So the email will go to everyone in engineering, okay, everyone have a look at it and see if your stuff's working, right? And this doesn't scale. So this was the problem. The problem was that teams scale up to a point. Maybe up to 10 people is fine. Well, as you get closer to 100 people, it gets increasingly hard. At Etsy have a very, very tightly controlled culture to run at about 100 to 150 people successfully. They do run a successful monolith with many, many updates a day. But the, to do that, they have their context is very large. They have a lot of training to get you into that culture. So the idea here is that you have lots of microcultures and bounded contexts that are very individually more productive, and you can work independently. So the, it was a conscious decision to try and make the development process scalable. It wasn't really about the, um, the scalability of the system as such. Uh, we could have had a monolith and just had lots and lots of them, and that would have scaled, right, as long as it was stateless. Right? So you, you mentioned about uh, the GitHub ecosystem and also the building things on existing or open, you know, open source stacks. So like, what about the challenges that are inherent in it? Because oftentimes you see there are a lot of Some move fast, some doesn't, and you know sometimes some just slows down and it goes in directions you haven't thought of. So yeah, it's a question about picking out which projects on GitHub are going to be successful, basically, because there's so many different ways to do everything. Especially if you're trying to build something. Yeah. Uh, it's really no different to the problem you already have with vendors, except you pay them money, and you, they also <laughs> did all of that. <laughs> except you've sunk some money into one of them. So the switching cost is less. Right. You still have to learn how to use the new thing, but at least you don't have to go and give a different vendor some money to find out that their thing doesn't work either. Right? So you try all these things. Um, I'd say the approach we took at Netflix was to um, create Pathfinder projects around new technologies, particularly when the transition to Cassandra was a very critical one because it really, really had to work because this is data and you don't want to lose your data. So those Pathfinder projects, they were uh, there was one service that we rebuilt to use it. We learned, did an awful lot of learning around that, a lot of tinkering. We rewrote the way the schemas were arranged like three different times until we figured out how to do it. So that was the Pathfinder. And once that worked and was in production and scaling and seemed to be working okay, then other teams started adopting it. Right? So, so Pathfinders and um, trying to figure out how to retire risk by doing experiments. Like, what is the biggest risk we have? Like this distributed project I said, where we had 200 terabytes of SSD for a few days. That was to retire a risk. It was like, do, can we use Cassandra as the basis of an active, active east-west global architecture? Or do we have to do something else? Right? So let's see if we can take that risk away by proving that Cassandra can or cannot do it. Part of that was we pushed nine gigabits of data for several hours from US East to US West without any problem. So 
that was kind of just, go, okay, we can push large volumes of data over this network, and it does seem to work. So those kinds of risks get retired by doing experiments. Should, I guess we're running into the next presenter's time, so you might want to <coughs> work on, I could continue to answer questions while somebody tries to plug in the next laptop, which I think is going to be an interesting uh, experiment. So, I'll let you unplug things then. Yeah. Uh, this is learning about that and recording everything. I'm not quite sure how. Maybe people. Okay. So you need to, I think, leave me in there, but make somebody else the uh, control. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Oh, the version management thing? So As Asgard really does that. Uh, so Asgard is the deployment tool that uh, you could talk about the team here. We you know more about it than, than I, I do at the current state of it. It's actually going through some re-engineering. But every service has a service root name, like the application name. And then there's a version, and then there's a tag, and there's all these things. So you can add tags on this. So there's multiple parts to a name. And you can, once you pull all those in, you get a different order scale group for every version, for example. And then you can route traffic between them. So the client libraries, um, the, the room library, which is the client library for Java, which knows how to call things, looks up in the service registry. I just want to talk to you know, application A. And you just say, I don't care which version. It'll go to it. all the versions of application A that are up. Maybe multiple, it be version A1, A2, and A3 are all currently up. It'll send traffic to all of them. Or you can say, I only want to talk to A3 because I need some feature that's only in A3. So it will stop talking to one and two. And eventually, um, ideally, you, you finally, all of the client libraries update and that old version of the protocol, the old version of the libraries are finally taken out of production. And you stop talking to the old version of the service and you can shut it down. And sometimes you have to go and shake the tree a bit and complain to people and say, please stop this. And then maybe you put in a find bugs rule that says nobody should be using this version of the library. And then use a conformity monkey in production to say this version of these things should never be seen in production. So if you keep starting old AMIs, it will send you annoying messages saying no, this doesn't work because the service it depends upon no longer exists. So you can do these assertions at build and at runtime uh, to enforce versioning. And uh, yeah, that's, the tooling to do that is not that difficult. <coughs> You just have to conceptually get get it into the into the tool. All set. Set. All right. Thanks. So we are a little behind schedule, um, and I'm going to accelerate uh, this this session so that we can try and catch up. Of course, the, the the two speakers after me uh, actually actually have much. Significantly more content. You can think of this as being a kind of a co 